All right, we are back with Yamaha. Phil Shea, how are you, my friend? Uh, I'm doing good today, Gene. I just, uh, like everyone else, we're working like crazy and doing the best we can. You know, it's good to be busy. It's good that we're thriving uh, in this industry and people are really passionate about home theater and hi-fi. We're going to be focusing on Yamaha hi-fi products. As you guys know, a couple of months ago, we had Kumasawa-san here in Tampa and we shot a bunch of awesome videos on the 5000 series. And we even covered the 2000 uh, network receiver as well. And that was a great time, Phil. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of fun. We got a lot done in a, just one day. And that's for sure. That was we, we, we really did. And, and, you know, the thing is, I was blown away. Like, I've always been a fan of Yamaha products. It's no secret. Um, I, I loved your hi-fi stuff. I always loved your flagship stuff. And to see the 5000 series up close yeah. touching it seeing the insides of it and more importantly the demos that we did i was blown away just how good that stuff sounds and how conservatively rated that m5000 amplifier i think yeah. it was rated at like what 100 watts at eight ohms but it doubled down and in, into four ohms and two ohms and it's bridgeable so you could get over 800 watts of power out yeah, of that no, beast. it was a the, beast. the thing is crazy it's just like a garden hose i it there's no restriction anywhere in the circuitry. All the components are huge. And when you, you know, if you hit the gas on it and you need a bass drum kick or something, it's going to come flying through there. No hesitation. So it, it's, it's cool. It was really kind of a benchmark for textbook, classic ideal textbook amplifier design, the way that it acts like a, a uh, perfect voltage source that it didn't care about the load. It was able to just continually pump out a constant voltage without it sagging. And the whole unit was fully balanced differential from input to output and the power supply was also floating. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's all the way through the preamp, <laughs> the turntable, the preamp and the power amp, it's uh, balanced and everything is floating as much as possible. Uh, actually, everything is floating. There's nothing on the signal path that is attached to ground anywhere mm -hmm. in the circuit path. And that's why it, it's so dynamic. I mean, when, you know, when something kicks, there's no, okay, where's zero and let's go up from there. It's just, it just goes. And then it's so transparent. Uh, the audio is just so, you can almost taste, <laughs> taste the sound coming out of it. It's just, uh, it's just so real. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I requested you guys send me the, the uh, 2000 series network receiver. I still have yet to um, bench test it. I will be bench testing that because that has a lot of the trickle down technology from the 5000 series. And that's really the flagship for your hi-fi components in terms of two channel network receivers. Yeah. But today we're going to be talking about some, some products that are more at, you know, down to earth pricing because the 2000, I think is almost, it's about $4,000. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 39, 99, 95. Awesome. We've got a super chat here from yeah. Brandon Burrow. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for the super chat. So you want to do a little, let's do a little side presentation. I've got the 1000 right here. It's really hard to see a black box with a black curtain here. I'm doing my best to show it, but uh, we do have a preview article that'll be linked in the description below, but I'm going to share the screen here, Phil, and then you could take us through this PowerPoint. So we could go over all the different feature sets, power, specs, all that stuff from all these products that are out there. All right here. There we go. Got a good view. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, I am going to back up just a little bit. We're, we're going to kind of slow roll into the product here uh, and talk a little bit about Yamaha Hi-Fi. And we'll talk about 5000 series coming up next because that's where all this spawns from the work we did on the 5000 series. But first, I wanted to show everyone a little piece of trivia. And I've been with Yamaha for almost four decades now. And I just learned this uh, within the last five years. And I think maybe it was just not many people knew this. That 1954 Yamaha, <laughs> this uh, audio player mm -hmm. is the first audio component ever uh, have the term hi-fi. It was a hi-fi 
uh, uh, record player or a hi-fi uh, player, I think is what they called it at the time. But it's just like it. It's just kind of funny that, you know, someone in marketing in 1954, well, let's just shorten high fidelity down to hi-fi. Because I think at the time, the only high fidelity uh, stuff you'd see in print was on uh, vinyl. I think at the time there wasn't any hardware that was that was termed hi-fi. And now it's a whole section, a whole segment of our industry is hi-fi. And Yamaha was the first to use that phrase in 1954. So that. does that have an amplifier built in or was that just strictly a turntable? No, I, I, you know what? I don't know. This is the only picture I've ever seen it. It doesn't even <laughs> have a model number. I suspect the amp is built in. It looks uh, like it, yeah. Because there was no other components at, at this time. So yeah. there had to be a little tube amp in there or something like that. So, um, yeah, I wish we knew more about this. This is the only picture I've ever seen that existed. I've, I've seen this picture for many years, but um, it just came to light um that it was a hi-fi component and that's thought that was very cool. funny okay so now you were talking you know we got to listen and play and touch the 5000 series yep this was in uh 2019 is when we launched this series this series and you know you, you met kumazawa the the head product man for uh this series here uh, we worked on this for over seven years. It was almost, well, eight years for the, um, the speakers themselves. Uh, it's an entire system. Uh, just a, for a point of reference, it's about $45,000 uh, for this setup right here. Uh, and you notice there's no cartridge on the phonograph and <laughs> there's no speaker wires attached. So you, you're starting out at 45 grand. Uh, but there were so many technologies. And, and this is what uh, Yamaha does and I've seen him do it uh, quite a few times over the years is when we're kind of in a good spot you know all, all the products are going good you know and we got good AV stuff going on and some decent hi-fi stuff all of a sudden we'll uh, get the engineers going we'll get a, a good team of engineers and we'll say hey here's our new goal we want the best piece of or the best hi-fi system in this case uh, that that you can possibly build. And that is like a, that's a dream come through for an engineer because these were not set at a price point. So when they started engineering this and started designing these, it, there wasn't a, and oh yeah, it has to hit $10,000 for the amplifier and it has to hit, you know, 7,000 for the, the preamp. No, it's like go all out and do do what it takes to make the best possible product that Yamaha can um, can produce, and that's my kind of engine. That's my kind of engineering. Don't yeah. design for a budget. Design to be best, and then figure it out later, and then use that technology to trickle down. Yeah, and, you know, you know, as your engineering background, you know, it's always that. You know, I worked with a guy who was an engineer. He's long retired now, but he used to always tell his start. He worked at a Westinghouse, and he was the head engineer. And that's when little clock radios back in there late 60s and early 70s were really popular you know and they had seven or three transistors in them and uh he had to engineer all that stuff but he was engineering it you know for a dollar 99 because they probably retailed for four bucks you know five bucks at, at the time and stuff like that and so i you feel the guys that do the entry level the the 300 stereo receivers uh those guys are sharp because to be able to do what they do with the constraints of the budget uh is really tough to do so uh they get right. to do that but for reward sometimes they get thrown on this you know an, another uh example of uh cutting them loose gene was the um z series the oh, z11 yeah. The, yeah the z11 the z9 they the av receivers uh to this day uh, th there's never been a receiver built like the z11 yeah uh what is it, I, even, I even i love the z1 i mean that was yeah, yeah. You know, uh, with it, the Pronto it, it, remote and everything. Yeah, that was oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Pronto remote. I actually yeah. like that remote. <laughs> yeah, it was because, you know, you could program it pretty Macros easy. Macros and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was pretty cool remote. But the, We have uh, a quick uh, quick super chat here. They're wondering, yeah. uh, will Yamaha be debuting at the Florida Audio Expo? Uh, no, no. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have any more trade shows uh, booked for this year. It's next year. February. Yeah, it, it or th this this fiscal oh, year. Oh, your so, fiscal year. Yeah, your yeah, fiscal year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
May or something. Yeah. Yeah. March. Uh, so anyway, yeah. So the Z series was an example of this. This series was an example. And again, they, there was no time constraint on it either. That was the beauty of the whole thing. So they had time to research and do all kinds of stuff. So this is in 2019 is when we finally debuted this. So most of last decade was uh, spent uh, learning on this. Well, then we launched uh, in 2020, the AS series. So these are the three integrated amplifiers. They use the same amplifier design uh, that's in the 5,000. This is a 3,000 series, right? Yeah, there's a 32, a 22, and a 1,200. So it's the uh, four, we call it, four, in house, we call it four digit integrateds. Because right. the, there's four digits in the in the model number, uh, and these are really premium. And these are there's no mistake where they came from. They came directly from the 5000 series, and that's part of all the engineering resources we put into the 5000 was to trickle it down eventually into uh, you know throughout the line. So that was in 2020. And then uh, last year, the very, very end of last year, we launched the RN2000. And that's the, the beast that you have. Uh, or I think you still, do you still have one or do you send I that do. one back? Yeah, okay, no, I do. that's I all right. To, I have to bench test it still. Good. <laughs> um, and this is the floating and balanced patented amplifier that we have. Uh, that we designed for the 5000 series, we put it in a stereo receiver. This this receiver right here is just ridiculous uh, with the sound quality. It, uh, it weighs. I, I picked the thing up because it's in my guest room. That thing weighs like 50 pounds. Yeah, it's it's uh, 48 and a half pounds, or something like that. So it's yeah, it's up there. Yeah, you got to think about it when you pick it up. It's like <laughs> you don't just bend over and lift lift it up. You got to kind of go. Well, this is going to be heavy. Let's let's grunt a little bit. Yeah. Um, so this is direct descended again of the 5000 series. Now this is a $4,000 stereo receiver. So a lot of people think, wow, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, Yamaha started out with audio in the US uh, around 1974 was when the first real products came out. Um, and it was a CA-1000. It was an integrated, kind of looked like the receiver. In 77, we came out with our second generation, the CR-2020. And that's what put Yamaha on the map. Because in the 70s, during that time frame, uh, audio was where it was at. There was no computers. There was no cell phones. There was no other distractions other than audio. Your buddies had audio. You have audio. All your friends. Everyone you know had some type of audio system. So it was like, the, we call it the golden age of, of audio. So when this piece came out, it was just an absolute hit. And that was, you know, because we were kind of still new kids on the block. We'd only been in the country, you know, three or four years uh, with other products, you know, trying to get a dealer base and try to get the word out that, hey, we're good stuff. But there's a lot of good products, you know, had already been established at that time. The CR2020 put us on the map and made people look at us. Now, the CR2020 uh, was $750 retail. Now, I already mentioned the RN2000 is uh, $4,000. So, but if you do the calculation, $750 in 1977 is equivalent to $3,800 in today's dollars. Yeah. If So, the 2000 is... $4,000, the CR2020 was $3,800. So $200 difference, you know, dollars from equivalent from year to year. Uh, but what's really, <laughs> you just got to dig into it and look at what you got. You have HDMI, you have uh, USB DAC, you have MusicCast, you have WIPOW, you have all kinds of stuff. But one of the cool things that we look at, I think this picture does a good job of uh, showing that. Let me zoom this in here because I think that's kind of cool. Is look at the styling. So look at the pure direct button up over here. Can you see my hand on yeah, the screen? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got that square pure direct button. Look all the buttons we had back in 1977, those little square buttons. Yeah. Uh, the bass and treble controls versus the knobs that we had back in those days. Uh, this little meter switch is very, very similar uh, to what we had there. I can't see what that meter 
what that what that switch is. Uh, the power switch, you know, these paddle switches and stuff like that. So when they did the 5000 series, uh, they took a serious look at design. They didn't want to just do something space age because we could. Uh, let's go back to Yamaha's heritage and let's keep some of that tradition alive. Yeah, you kept that vintage look. Yeah, and it's actually I like the new I like the new power meters even better because they're bigger. You know, they're they're backlit well. I mean, they're beautiful. Yeah, uh, well, here there's a okay. Here's a trivia thing. Somebody right put a comment here saying they wish you would trickle down the meters to all your products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know how much? It, yeah, yeah, meters. That's one thing that's really expensive. I've heard the engineers talk about that. Yeah. Um, these two meters right here are actually uh, uh, power meters. But this meter in the middle, there's actually a button right here. So it's speaker out or signal quality. So when you're tuning your FM tuner, yeah, you have the center right there. And then this would switch over and tell you how clean the signal is of the IF signal going through the receiver. Oh, wow, yeah. So once you get dialed in perfect on top of the station, then you hit the little this button right here. And it'll go back and then these will be, you know, your left and right power meters. You know, I have so a quick they, funny. I have a quick funny story about Yamaha tuners for you. So back in the day when I had um, my old house, I'm talking about early 2000s. I had, I think, I had a Yamaha DSP A1 or something or Z1, something one okay. of your products that didn't have a tuner. And I bought a used Yamaha tuner. <clears throat> excuse me. It was one of the ones that were red. It was like a m80 or something like that yeah so yeah I, yeah the m80 and the m85 yeah the t80 t85 t85 was good yeah tuner. something like that so I, I got this tuner i plugged it into my my uh home theater system and when i tuned in a channel it felt like i was listening to a cd like there was no noise when, when i compared it to my receiver i had next to it the yep. tuner in that it was night and day i mean you're talking about a product that was made in the 80s versus a modern product and how they they just didn't have high priority in tuners and AV receivers today like they did back in the you know 70s and 80s because that was really the golden era of of fm people took that stuff really serious they wanted i didn't realize you could get that level of fidelity out oh of the tuner. yeah and Yam yamaha's made some pretty spectacular tuners but but the thing you got to remember gene is you only had two sources basically for mm -hmm. audio you had fm you had vinyl and then you had tape. Yeah. And so there, you, FM listening was common. That's why there were stations that played albums, all that stuff, because you didn't have 75 streaming services and all that back then. That that was your primary source of music uh, was FM. That was one of the, the big three. So, of course, there had to be a ton of uh, uh, development into those tuners. And there's it's pretty cool stuff. And it's kind of sad now that the tuners are just one chip and a digital yeah. controller but um the amount of work that we used to put into those things but anyway let's let's move on here you and i get sidetracked on we do so just... i've got the r i've got the rn 1000 right here actually it just it just turned off so i'll turn i'll try to turn it back on it's gonna be hard to see it from here but so the 1000 is based on the 2000 only it's significantly cheaper so obviously there had to be some uh areas where you guys scale back a little bit but you yeah probably, you probably retained a lot of the great stuff like the digital front end and stuff right okay so the 2000 uh you ha first of all you have cool meters that's yeah. the, that's the first thing you notice is you're you're missing the meters but it had that floating balanced app amplifier with mosfet uh output drivers um the pro dad oh a huge toroid transformer where yeah, now when we go down here so there's some stuff we had to, you know some of that high-end stuff we had to leave behind but the 1000 has the same feature set that the 2000 has for less than half the price this is a 1800 uh receiver versus uh four thousand dollars so basically you're missing the ultra high performance amplifier but you're getting a really good class A, B amplifier and you're retaining all the features, you know, the HDMI uh, arc input, uh, USB DAC, uh, YPOW, you know, all the features 
that made the 2000 so cool drop directly in here and you know it's half the price is less than half the price well so let me ask you this because i reviewed one of your integrated amps probably five or six years ago it was the as801 which okay. is an excellent measuring and sounding integrated i mean this is probably a notch above that right i mean that that thing measured great it sounded great yeah it it's going to be key. kind of in that class you know but the 801 is pretty old too so that was yeah. uh uh, you know, so we've had five more years of, of development. So, and there's some special components that we bought for this one. The 801 was in the middle of the integrated line when it was out. Yeah. Um, so, and this is our flagship of the standard line. Remember I said four digits for the integrated, you know, we call right. it four digits. This one, we kind of cheated a little bit and we think it should have been a 999. <laughs> because it's not for it's not quite four digit integrated amplifier quality, but it's four digit stereo receiver quality. So, but that's just an internal thing so that we mess around with. Anytime you see an N in a model number now for Yamaha integrated, it's you're, it's safe to assume it's a network network. Yes, product. yeah. So it supports music cast. It supports you know any a web interface, all that stuff, right? Yep. And we'll uh, let's just let's just jump right in because I'll show you all the features that we have. In. Uh, first of all, this is the goals for we you know true sound is our goal. Uh, tonal balance, uh, everything has to be accurate. Voices and instruments have to be separated. Dynamics and the dynamics is not how loud it is necessarily, you know, which they are loud, uh, but it's the uh, the silence in between uh, the notes, and of course the imaging. And in uh, you know, all the nuances, you know, the breath, the atmosphere of the room of the recording. And so that's true sound is what the engineers go for. It's kind of what they start with is that's their goal. And if they do something that's really cool, but it doesn't fall into one of those three categories, uh, it kind of gets uh, shoveled off the side because that's not our, our design goal. Okay, the, the 2000 and integrateds and the separates the 5000 series all have these just super massive chassis with all kinds of bracketing and stuff like that when we drop down into the 1000 and 800 and 600 at the same time uh, we have a technology called top art total purity audio reproduction technology uh, basically it's a symmetrical design so left and right channels are separated power supply is central you know to get the current to the uh the transistors themselves and then there's this acrylic plastic resin not acrylic a resin plastic base uh that's anti-resonant and anti um harmonic so uh it does a really good job of damping uh, materials and we've actually been using this uh in products uh, going back to the mid 90s is when we first trademarked this uh this technology it's a it's a whole number of things uh the thing that's most obvious is the the top art base. And Phil, let me back you up for a second. Um, look at like that's a good diagram right there. Okay, so yeah. if you just buy, if you just buy a Yamaha AV receiver, a multi-channel receiver, you're going to get two output devices per channel because you've got seven up to thirteen channels of amplification into yeah. the chassis. Yeah. Notice how you you doubled up the power transistors in these models. And what that does, when you double up the power transistors, is it gives you more current capability to drive low impedances. And that's really the advantage here when you go into a two-channel integrated amp like this as opposed to just an AV receiver. It, it, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it uh, it doubles the pipeline, the size of the pipeline. You know, So we can shove more electrons through there because we have twice as many devices. Um, you know, and get it to where it needs to go to do the work that it needs to do uh, as smoothly as possible. And yeah, AV receivers are just a miracle. Sometimes I think that they sound so darn good. They do, yeah. <laughs> because so, there's so much going on. There's so much. So, so this question for I, I'm I'm going to assume this applies to the 1,000 and below. And I'm going to, like you said before, they all use EI uh, transformers, not a toroid. The toroid's right, only in right. the 2,000. The 2,000 has the toroid. Correct. And the 2000 also has double the capacitor bank. So you see there's two caps there. I yep. remember when I looked at the 2004. So it was like a mini 5000 amp, if you think about yeah. it. Yeah. 
Uh, and then there are there are special they're custom uh, the 2000 is custom built. They're like expensive custom built. These are custom spec in the yeah. 1000 and down. You know they are you know built to our spec, but the other ones are uh, very expensive. And the advantage of that again is low ESR. You just have less power supply ripple, less noise. I mean, there's when you guys talk about custom building parts like this, it's not something to be taken lightly. There's a huge expense to that because you're not building a million of them, right? I mean, you're you're yeah. doing small quantities, so it's going to be expensive to customize a part like that. Yeah, and it has a lot to do with the chem the chemistry of the electrolyte uh, because you want a filter cap to charge up. You know, cause it hold it's holding energy. That's we built we charge it up with electricity. And then whenever the um, the transistors turn on and need a dump, it, it provides the energy to those transistors. So there's so many um, variables in a capacitor. It needs to charge up. It needs to smooth out any ripple and any noise and not be noisy. But it also needs to be able to dump current instantly when it's mm -hmm. asked to. So it's like there's a whole science between uh, behind capacitors, and it's just oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to have a hysteresis effect where it's just taking... Oh, yeah, know, where it takes a while out. to get out. You know, the ESR is, is a perfect example of that. That just clogs everything up. I don't see a fifth foot in this diagram. No, there is no five feet on these models. The uh, the chassis, there's bracketing and stuff like that that's in there. So you and, damped a uh, bit. You, yeah, you did a more yeah. elaborate damping system. Yeah, and then the, the, the art base takes care of a lot of that. You know, and when you, you know, we're only doing two channels, you know, everything's a lot more compact and we're not dealing with uh, 11 channels of craziness. That's a good way to put it. So this top art base is in all three models. Uh, the 1000 does have a double bottom panel. It's one millimeter thick. Uh, it, it seems like, hey, that's not, okay, so you put a metal plate on there. Okay, what's the big deal? Hey, it adds more mass uh, and prevents more uh, vibration uh and resonances and things like that it makes a huge difference uh you you have a little bit thicker one in the 2000 gene uh, mm -hmm. but we're able to keep it in the 1000 and get a, a millimeter thick uh, metal damping uh plate that's in there and that really makes a difference you know so much of what the, we learned on the 5000 series was to keep everything rigid, mechanically rigid. So there's no vibration. There's no external influences. There's no internal influence. So the right channel is not affecting the left channel. The power supply is not affecting, yeah. adversely affecting anything. And if you got, if you have a big floppy uh, chassis that's vibrating around and it's thin metal and stuff like that, then you're going to start, things are going to start interacting. And yeah, it's a little bit, but a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. Also, oh, there's no doubt it'll increase, it'll yeah. increase your noise for sure. So we got a we got a question here. I think it's a good one. I'm going to put it up here for you, Phil. With the NS2000A speakers, 8,000 a pair released recently with these new amps, be considered a significant upgrade over the NSF901 speakers from a few years ago. I'm not familiar with that model. Yeah, the the 901s. Yeah, it, they they are, but uh, it's two different applications. The 901s were built uh, for home theater primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're great uh, theater. They're, they're really good for audio. You know, of course, you know, a good speaker is a good speaker. But it's kind of more for a, uh, a home theater use. So they're a little more directional, not quite as... Are those the ones that had the white cones and they had like the horn flares on them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were kind of tapered at the top. The design is really cool. They look very nice. They had kind of a wedge cut out of the, the top mm -hmm. of them. Uh, the 2000s are strictly audio, two-channel audio. That's their only use. And, you know, they they can't do double duty. You know, it's not recommended. I guess you could, but they're not recommended for double duty. Of course, I will do that at a show if that's my best speaker. But uh, their their strength is in two channel sound reproduction. And you don't have a matching center channel. You don't have a matching center channel no, for those. No, anyway. yeah. no. Uh, there will be two bookshelves coming out uh, early next year uh, with the same material. So uh, we announced those, but uh, well, maybe we didn't announce those. Is that the me. NS800 and NS600s? Yes, that's those. Yeah, we have that in our article. Um, on oh, our okay, article. good. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we know about this stuff so long that you don't know when you forget when you have the green light to uh, 
<laughs> yeah, the NS eight hundred A's are twenty four hundred dollars each, and the NS six hundred A's are four uh, fifteen hundred each. Yeah, fourteen fifteen hundred each. Yeah, <clears throat> and those are cool. Those are neat. I, I hadn't listened to bookshelves in a long time. Uh, I started out listening, you know, doing audio file listening, you know, with, with bookshelves, with two way bookshelves, and you know that I forgot how good. A, a beautiful pair of bookshelves can be how well they can image. Oh yeah, they disappear. They could disappear in a room very easily. Yeah. Okay, uh, we got special feet. We've used these feet on some of the Avantage. Uh, they got all kinds of weird designs, but this is all for mechanical um, isolation mm -hmm. of the um, you know external forces to the inside. Uh, again, custom made block capacitors. Uh, Big transformer, actually a real big transformer for, you know, it's a hundred watt times two. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, when you see a hundred watt times seven uh, in some of these AV receivers, sometimes you will see transformers that are smaller than this. Oh, yeah. Uh, that we have in there. Uh, anything where there's high current, yeah, these little chrome things, they're called bus bars. So, any high current, any ground circuits or anything like that, we want to make sure that we have like zero resistance. Uh, we'll just add this and don't trust the foil patterns uh, to get all the current where you need it to be. Oh, yeah. Uh, uses ESS 32 uh, bit DACs. Uh, the 2000 actually uses the Pro DAC. Yeah, Gene, you and I talked about that earlier, and I went back and double checked that. So that uses the Pro DAC, um, and I get into the details on it, but maybe not for this audience. Or do you yeah. guys don't you do your own reclocking or something? I, I seem to remember. Maybe that was on your AV receivers. Is that? Uh, yeah, we had. I I don't think we use. No, we don't use our own chip anymore. I do know that. Uh, but for a long time, we used our own uh, digital interface, DIT, digital interface transceiver. Yeah. And what that, that was a chip that we built, uh, built in our factory. And that would, um, it syncs the clock. So any external, so you shove in, you know, digital signal into it, it will grab that signal and then control all the clocks on the receivers or the, you know, ample, whatever, whatever device is circuit board so it knocks down jitter it, it's really hard because when you're shoving you know a digital bit stream into the product you know the product has to catch that <laughs> and then try to and try to sync up with it so it's uh yeah that's a whole art form right there mm. <laughs> but i think now it's it's not the yamaha chip and i think that uh function is now integrated into some of the interface uh some of the other digital chips oh okay uh, any place again where it's high current, then we'll use screws. Look, no solder on this uh, lug connection here. Yeah, the the best connection is no solder. I had someone asking me that, and I was taught that by an engineer in 1988. I saw this speaker and I take it. I took it apart because I was kind of a speaker freak back then. And then so I I wrote to uh, Japan. And I said, hey, uh, just to let you know. Uh, the guys in the assembly line forgot to solder uh, the speaker wire to the to the woofer. They just had it wrapped around there, and then they had heat shrink on it. Well, then he sent me a picture back, and they did testing, and they took a block of wood, and they did 60 connections, wire to wire to wire to wire to wire to wire, you know, just loop, 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 and soldered everything to lugs. And I don't remember what the resistance was, but it was actually huge. It was very measurable. So your best connection. So uh, when you're doing speaker wires on the back of your product, yeah. the best connection is no connector. Yeah, and because if you can compress that wire onto the connector, you you reduce the contact resistance. And sometimes if you just put a piece of wire over a connector and then use wave flow soldering, it's not making that great contact. Yeah. And you can actually get um, solder joint problems over yeah. time. It gets yeah. air built in and you get cold solder joints. Now, I use banana jacks all the time just because I'm playing and connecting and reconnecting and stuff. And in my mind, banana jacks are probably not the worst, but they're they're not the best by far. Yeah. Because, you know, if you look at the physics and get down really close to it, there's really only a few uh, connection points between the inside of the jack and the, the banana plug itself. And it's... Uh, but it's like so much easier than 
bear. Well, I like the away. compression one. Like Kim, Kimber makes a really good WBT, and when you yep. when you stick it in the back and you screw it, it expands. yeah, and then you get to screw it down and expand. Yeah, those types those types are good. Those are great. It's, yeah. yeah, it's it's the little mono price ones. You know, we yeah, just those are those clip it on the wire. Loose. Yeah, but I'm guilty of using those all the time just so that, because of the. But uh, I like the Kimber ones. Yep. Uh, gold plating on, on the 1000 on everything and gold plating, it, you know, it looks cool in my mind. It doesn't do anything when they're brand new, uh, a clean, uh, nickel plated connection when it's brand new is very low in PNC. You know, when I used to work on the bench, I, it was, we used to test this stuff all the time. Uh, what it, ha I think what it does for me is I want gold on all my stuff is longevity. So five years from now, 10 years from now, the gold connector is going to give you a much better connection, a lower distortion. You won't get that third harmonic distortion from a bad uh, uh, connection. And it's not just the speaker terminals, it's the RCA cables and air terminals and everything else. So that was the construction exercise. I think we got a couple more things to do. We're going to talk about the YPOW real quick. <clears throat> so this is, you know, the auto calibration that we use in our AV receivers. Uh, we've been doing this for a year. I think 2003 or 2002 was the first time we came out with this. And so we've been developing and evolving it uh, ever since. And you see up here at the top is YPOW for AV receivers, Yamaha Parametric Acoustic Optimizer. Don't need to know what it is. Uh, when you're trying to uh, optimize seven speakers or 11 speakers or whatever it is, uh, you need to do that for home theater <clears throat> because you have big main speakers up front, uh, you have a center channel, you got surrounds, you might have some in ceiling somewhere. So you have different sizes, different drivers. They're not uh, timbre matched. Um, different efficiencies and all those types of things. So what uh, we do as an industry is we have to adjust all the speakers to a selected target curve. And with Yamaha, we have, you know, we have three, we have flat, which is usually horrible. Natural mm -hmm. gives us <laughs> a little, a little curve or front, which is actually, I, I use that quite a bit is uh, we actually measure their left and right main speakers. Cause we assume that that's your best speakers. Um, and then we try to EQ the rest of the speakers in the system to match that. Uh, and then we use PEQ and then you have to do down mixing and bass management and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on to try to make an AV receiver sound good, and it's pretty effective. But when we go to YPOW for Hi-Fi, it's a whole different ball game. In some ways, it's a lot easier uh, because we don't, we're not trying to hit a target curve. We're only trying to match two uh, speakers so they sound the same. Now, I'll show you some examples here in a second. We're not doing a down mixing. Uh, and the most important thing is we don't want to lose any dynamic range or we don't want to raise the noise floor. So by boosting something at a certain frequency, you know, 100 hertz or 1K, you're boosting the frequency at 1K, you're also pulling up the noise at 1K. So if you boost something 4 dB or 6 dB or 3, whatever it is, to try to match the other channel, you're also raising the noise floor in that frequency band uh, up that much. And that, you know, that goes against our dynamic um, uh, credo at, at the top, you know, for true sound. We want to get that dynamic range, but we got to stay above that, uh, it, you know, not screw up the, uh, the noise floor. Uh, you guys have all seen this, and you know you put a stereo system just about anywhere. Most places, it's not good. Uh, like all most, yeah, most places is not good. You got furniture, you got stuff like that. You got different surfaces. Um, let me see if I can walk you through this and explain to you what our what our thoughts is, what our engineers' thoughts were on this. 
So this is a sweep of the left and right channel in a imaginary room. I don't even know if it's imaginary. It might be a real room. You know, because when you see uh, frequency responses of speakers, they're all done in anechoic chambers in perfect mm -hmm. conditions, and the speakers always look awesome. Uh, you start throwing in a room. Uh, I'm looking at this one right here, this left channel. There's a big, you know, you know, 4 dB spike up here. Well, that's that's definitely room related. That's up against a couch or close to the wall or something. Yeah, you're in the modal area of the uh, Yeah, the room. There, there's something going on. Uh, the right channel kind of looks okay, but then the left channel, you got this big dip right here. I don't know. You're in another, you know, you're in a null in there. But as you go up the channel, that, you know, we always know that EQ ink, the low frequencies is the most important because that's the most messed up. You know, you got 4 dB. Uh, but look, even going all the way up the spectrum, we, we're having these little one and, and you know half dB and one dB plus and minus. So you kind of see uh, it's messed up. And these are all, this is all room stuff because we're only measuring two speakers. Those two speakers are made at the same factory and they're made to play together to do a good amp. Uh, the speakers sound are, would be perfect, both of them in an anechoic chamber. So any deviation that you see here, that is room. That's your room. Now, can't always fix the room, but let's let me let me just focus on imaging because this is what we're kind of focusing on with this wide pow hi-fi. If you're listening to something, uh, a singer or a musical instrument that's mixed to the center, you should close your eyes and it should sound like it's coming from dead center. Um, I think, okay, I got a guitar here for, uh, for instance. So, you know, you close your eyes and if it's mic right in the way it's, it's mixed, they want it to come from the center. It's going to come from dead center. But, uh, let's look at a guitar frequency response, for instance, <laughs> uh, any stringed instrument will, will have the same thing. The voices are the same, uh, brass uh, instruments are not just one note. The only thing that's one note is a tuning fork. The tuning fork is the only thing that doesn't have harmonics. So I could play the tuning fork really well. <laughs> Never be out of tune. Yeah. Okay. So in this case right here in a guitar, and this is uh, I, about a C. I think it's a little bit sharp of a C uh, on an on a acoustic guitar or electric guitar for that matter. Uh, but the way the string vibrates, there's a second harmonic that's double the frequency of the fundamental. And look, it's actually pretty high compared to the fundamental. Yeah. Third and fourth harmonics are still up there quite a bit. And the fifth harmonic. So what, if I play a note down here, if you look, it's got harmonics that spread throughout the whole spectrum. So let's see what that means for us here. So let's look back at our, our uh, chart again. And we, we're targeting the center. We're trying to get that purple X in the center. But look at this frequency. If that's the fundamental note of that one note, it's going to sound like it's coming off to the left because it's 4 dB higher on the left than it is on the right. So it's like turning the balance control on the receiver. Now let's go up to the next notch up here. Now you see the right channel is a lot higher. So the right channel is to the right of you know where the, that guitar should sound like it's coming from. And it gets worse because it goes left, right, left, right, left, right. Uh, you're going to end up with something like this. So one strum on the guitar, it's not going to be perfect. And you, I think you've all heard this before. You, you're hearing a vocal, you're hearing a vocalist sing, and it's like they're in the center, but it's not like a human head there. It's kind of like maybe it's a foot wide. The voice is sounding like it's coming like from a foot wide. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. still in between the speakers, but it's not – you know, a mouth like this. Yeah. yeah. And that's where all these little things start to confuse the image. So what you end up with, oh, this, there we go, my great artwork here, is where is that guitar? Yeah, it's in the center. But depending on which harmonic you're living, it's to the left or to the right. And that's where you get that kind of, not pinpoint, but now it's, you know, it's kind of blurred just a little bit. It still might sound awesome. You know, because they're great speakers and, the, you know, the music's all good and all that. But we can tighten it up by using YPOW. 
Uh, so all we have to do is match the response of both speakers. We're not trying to do super room correction and make everything a flat frequency response because we don't know what your room is. And, you know, you got to do room treatments. If you, if you want to, the more critical you want to get, the more you got to get your room. Uh, yeah, there's no, no matter up. how sophisticated a room correction system is, whether you go from this or to your AV receiver, YPOW or Dirac or Odyssey or the end of the day is if you have a bad room, you could just make that bad. You can EQ a bad room, but it's still a bad room. You're not going to be able to fix the sound. You got to get I your mean, K time it, down significantly and you got to balance out the acoustics in the room. Give Gene, it a fight er, yeah. Every interview that you do, you know, from whoever it is some room treatment and from room calibration, what's the first thing, the room, the room, the room, you know, and you know, there's many different ways of doing that, but you know, Hey, sometimes, you're stuck. There's no magic button, unfortunately. That's going to fix everything. I do have a quick question, if you don't mind. Because yeah. you, yeah. you said Yamaha, YPOW Hi-Fi doesn't have base management. But I'm looking at the back of the 1000, and it has a subwoofer out. So is that subwoofer out a line level full bandwidth, or is it base managed? Because the 801, yeah, the 801 had a crossover. It was like 90, 80 or 90 hertz. Yeah, so it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's selectable. Uh, is 20, 46. It goes by 10, 10 hertz increments. Oh, okay. Is it fourth order? All right. Second order, fourth know. order? I don't know. I don't, I don't have the schematic for this one yet. Okay, but you can't... The, the speakers always run full range, though, right? There's no base... Uh, you can add cut to them as well. Oh, good. Oh, that's yeah. So there is base management. It's just YPOW doesn't select the base management, but you have man, you have manual control of base management. Okay, correct. And I'll, I'll show you in the app when we get to that after this, right after this part is our next section. So what we're going to try to do is we try not to boost anything because remember that noise floor that we're trying not to mess with. All mm -hmm. we want to do is match everything. So now we're going to end up with kind of a little weird curve. We flattened it out quite a bit. Uh, you think this right channel is probably where it should be, but I don't, if this is a null right here, how much do I have to boost the left channel to overcome that? null? you know, I mm -hmm. might have to do a, you know, it's only what two dB apart, but I might have to boost it four dB to get it to come up, you know, because I'm in the, the null of the room. It's not a one-to-one -one anymore, but by doing it this way, at least we get the imaging perfect. So that guitar is going to be focused because both channels are performing in the room identically. So we're going to get that, uh, that perfect, uh, perfect imaging uh, in the thing. Uh, both of the, all three of these receivers have a speakers, a B and speakers, a plus B. And we do YPOW for all three combinations. So if I have some bookshelves on B, some floor standards on A, and sometimes I want to listen to them both together, uh, is three sets of YPOW calibration. So it does the best as can to. Uh, oh, know, wow. Whatever. So you actually, so you have three presets basically. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I'll, I'll show you that in the app coming up next. Uh, YPOW volume. This is for low listening. And actually, this works really well. I, it works in my office here because I use it as background music during the day, but it's not just a loudness correction. It, it, when it's measuring, it measures the efficiency of speakers. So it knows where to put the curve and when to dial it in. So, so it's almost like a variable loudness, basically. Uh, yes, it is variable loudness, but it's a, then it gets attached to the volume and it's switchable on and off. So so now how do you access the app? The app is through your phone or is it, do you have a web interface that you could also access? Uh, no, it's, it, pr everything is pretty much on the music cast app now, you know? Oh, okay. Let me see if I can pull that up for you right now. Yeah. Let me try to zoom in there for you a little bit. Oh yeah. I forgot. This is kind of small because. I don't know. So now what, what happens if you have two of these receivers in your house? Are you able to switch between the two different models in, in uh, music cast? Yeah, because, well, here, let me just turn it off here. So this is my office here. So these are all the devices I have in my office. So you can see, I don't need that on. So if I had, you know, I can have three RN2000s in here. I could have six of them in here mm -hmm. for that matter. Uh, 
because the IP addresses are different all over. The MAC addresses are different. Uh, I wouldn't call them by them. I write the model numbers on here. You can change whatever, you know, you can say Billy's room and Susie's room or whatever it is. I just put the model numbers because it's my work area. Um, so let me just turn this on. Can I relabel if I have two RN 1000s? Can I relabel them? Absolutely. So I know which one's which? Okay. Yeah, let's let's go there right now. So I'll go to the settings. Cause I, so here's my RN 1000. And here is my room name. I can type in whatever I want. It's got some preset stuff, or I can put Phil's room or whatever it is. Uh, I can change the photo. Phil's party house. Phil's party house. <laughs> this is where I party all day long. <laughs> Phil's in Kenland. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, uh, you can take a photo and do all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's all. So if I had seven RN one thousands in here, I just uh, it's kind of you. It's kind of more ideal to call them out by the um, room that they're in. I and have. If you've got of, seven RN one thousands in your house, you're a baller. Yeah, I think so. That would qualify. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go down. So you know, then you go into your count settings, and I'm not. This isn't a music cast training, but uh, I'll show you where it is now. Because uh, we used to do um, uh, web. Uh, control. So you type in the IP address of the device, uh, and then and it gave you a whole bunch of menu stuff that you. There can is adjust. there's the base management. By the way, it says full band crossover. Yep. And so, oh, you can so, even set the distances of your speakers too. Yeah, yep. And you asked me about that, and it kind of surprised me, but because basically that's a balance control. But okay, this is speakers A, and I just calibrated this this afternoon. Uh, the subwoofer, yeah. uh, so let's say, you know, let me see if I like, maybe I don't even like the Y Powell, uh, calibration. I just shut it off and look, everything disappeared. That's under it. So now it's yeah. just straight two channel. It's your speakers and your amp with no calibration. I turn it back on. Uh, and then I say, you know what, do I want a subwoofer? Uh, yeah, let's add a subwoofer and let's say I'm using these little bookshelves. So then we'll, um, Add the low cut to that, and then I select a crossover. You know, it's not micro dialed in, but you know, you got a pretty good selection. And I use good. Yeah, no, that's I had very few integrated amps have this flexibility. So the distance thing is not something to be taken lightly. If you really want to improve the imaging of your system, and you could do this with measurements, but you could do it with just listening. If you want a good test track for something like that, take Tracy Chapman's fast car. For example, mm -hmm. you play that in two channel and then you go and adjust your your distances of your left and right speaker. I'm talking about maybe a tenth of a foot or two tenths of a it, foot. It, it's that much. It, it's nothing. It will focus you, especially at the main listening position. You will see that focus that Phil's talking about. So even after you've had all the EQ done with YPOW, I would go in and, and fine tune your distance, especially for the main for the MLP, your main listening position. Because that's really going to focus and tighten your imaging. Yeah. Now, why how does does Wipeout tell you the distances, or do you have to manually put that? Will it calculate? No, it, that that was calculated. That was. Oh, calculated okay. Right Good. Well, there it should be. I mean, it should be spot on at that point. Yeah, and it's uh, this our Wipeout is accurate within a half a centimeter. Yeah. So it, it's that close. So if just the the act of you breathe inhaling and exhaling. We'll put you in and, in and out of calibration. Like, now, does this just do one measurement, or do you have to move the mic around in multiple? No, measures? it's a it's a single measurement. It's it's hi fi. It's it's trip two channel critical listening. Right. You know that this isn't a party thing for your friends. This is a for personal enjoyment to get the maximum out of your speakers and your your system. And so that, that's kind of in here. And then let's say, remember I said it had speakers A, B, and A plus B. Let's go to speakers B. Oh, I didn't run YPOM. I don't have a B set up on this uh, receiver. But it says, hey, uh, if you want to do this stuff, just connect the mic up, and then we'll run through the, the test. And the cool thing, the test only takes about 45 seconds because it's not doing 11.2 yeah. channels of speakers. Well, the cool thing about that is if you really wanted to, you could just set up a second zone somewhere else in the house and then just using the app, switch over to speaker B, turn up speaker A. Yep. And you've got a separate uh, 
you know, a whole separate calibration for that. Uh, so let's, uh, now there's a uh, title on music cast. Does that support flack like full resolution? I mean, does the music cast title, is it all the layers of title? Yes, it goes all, I don't have the numbers, but what's, um, well, we don't really care about MQA anymore, but we could. We yeah, just, I yeah. Know, I just want to know that it does flack. It will. Yes. Be, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's up yeah. 192 or something like that. It, it, it's. And, and that's the other there. thing, I, uh, Phil, about YPOW is it's one of the few correction systems that do, that goes all the way to full sampling rate. I think it does it in 96 kilohertz, right? It doesn't downsample. No, it doesn't. It, it's a 64 bit 192 processor that does the, cal the calculations. And it can handle up to 192 under certain conditions. Uh, in AV receivers, uh, there are so many uh, configurations because you had uh, base management, audio delay, and all that stuff. So when you start adding more features onto it, uh, you would start to lose resolution. You could not, no longer maintain that 96 or the 192K sure. uh, resolution. But with the two channel stuff right here, it's wide open because it's now it's barely sweating to do any of the any of the processing. So a quick question on your base management. I think I know the answer. They're asking, can you separately control the high pass and subwoofer crossover? I'm gonna probably no. guess no. No. So whatever you yeah, okay. I'm curious if it's 12 dB per octave on the high pass and 24 on the low pass. I'll measure it. Yeah, I, that'd be that would be good to know. Does the 2000 have the same base management feature as the 1000? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. So, yeah. So, you have it right there. I like that so, you got Bob Jeans up there. Oh, uh, we love him. He, you know, he's been a Yamaha artist for over 40 years. Amazing uh, dude, man. Amazing. I've been listening to his music since the 80s. This is a brand new album. Now, he came to our booth at Axpona and I know, spent, I that. spent an afternoon with us. But here's what's cool. So, you know, just let's flash off so i got the volume going right here and don't want to get demonetized but let's say i want to play this uh in my office and i also want to play it in my office and this is in my office this is in my office. oh there's his own oh, oh so you're casting it to you're casting that stream to all those different devices yep and so now it's, it's linking them all up and now when i turn the volume up and down look what happens will they be synced up in in um digitally like they're they're all in sync now. I can do them individual, and I can mute them individually. So maybe I got to take a phone call, and this is over, you know, in the room. I want to take a phone call in. Sure, I can I can mute all of them. But you know, in in my house here, it's usually mainly for football uh, Sundays is when I have, and I'll have like five uh, hooked up throughout the house, so I can walk around the house during halftime and commercials and stuff like that you know i just have to throw one thing out to show you how serious of a company yamaha is with music look at the endorsements that you guys have you have bob james you have antonio sanchez who's one of the best jazz drummers of our time it's like you have all the awesome jazz musicians on your on your side basically yeah. either using your instruments or using your audio gear i love that yeah and it's uh it's many of these guys have been, you know, uh, Nathan East, a bass player, you know, love Nathan East from Foreplay, yeah, yeah, from Foreplay with Bob James. You know, they started yep. out in Lee Rittenauer and those guys, uh, they're all they're Yamaha forever. Oh, Bob James, you know, when um, he spent the afternoon signing autographs, he's, he's promoting his uh, new album, uh, this one right here, and uh, you know, it's phenomenal recording, by the way, if you're. So Phil, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you if you can get Bob James, Lee Rittenauer, or Nathan East on my on a live stream with me, <laughs> and, and, and preferably play some four play tunes. I would love, love. I would, I would just love to interview them. These are guys that have been huge influences on me for decades. And well, you you know what's interesting about Bob? He's a huge audiophile. He has a five thousand series uh, system. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we were talking about. He might even read Audioholics content for all we know. You know, it's been around. He could. He, yeah. he travels the world a lot. So he's not always in the U.S. And um, but he's definitely an audiophile guy. And we were talking audiophile stuff for a long time. Sweet. He was very excited about that. So. So I don't know. Was there something else I wanted to show? And, then, and I can. Do them all if I'd like. Do that. 
Oh, there, we do want to address um, in the press releases you sent. It was weird because the way you spec power on the 600, you spec it at all the other models are spec at eight ohms and six ohms. For some reason, you spec the 600, which is the lowest end model, at four ohms, and the power was less at four ohms than it was at eight. And right away, that triggered my. You must have the impedance switch set low. Yes, yeah, I would yeah. recommend never setting it low, but I know you have to meet a UL requirement for heat dissipation, and it's there. For yeah, that. and you know what? In the specs I have here, don't have all that stuff in there. Where are we out on time? Oh, we, we, oh, we, we start we, winding we, down. We BS too much. Yeah, sorry. Um, these are just some beauty shots here, and let's see if I can get that back up. You could throw up that spec table after that if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll bring it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just kind of finish up on that. So, so HDMI the, arc on that. Uh, basically, if you want, you could plug the HDMI from. You could plug in all your sources to your TV, and then run one cable from your TV into the Yamaha. And it, and it, it doesn't even have to be all your sources, but you know, maybe you have a, you know, your Apple TV, or you know, you got, or maybe it's one of the streaming apps that you have on one of your smart TVs that also does music. Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you do Amazon Music, and Amazon's up on your app, and you watch movies on it. Oh, let's just play the music. Well, it just arcs right back down to the receiver. You know, because at your TV yep. with all the streaming services, in it, we can just run backwards, uh, right down in there. So. It's not ER because we don't need multi-channel. It's not doing Atmos or anything like that. It's a two-channel device. Uh, the USB DAC function, uh, this is for playing music off your laptop or your computer. Right. It, and there's software that you can download for that. Uh, tuner, opticals, phono, pre-out, sub-out, anti-resonant feet we looked at. And that's the 1000. All three of these models, all four of the models come in silver and black. So if you want the retro silver or you like the more modern black. And it's kind of the same thing. We got a few less uh, uh, deals here. Oh, wait, this is still the 1000. There we go. The 800. OK, we lose the, the uh, HDMI on the 800, but we still have the USB DAC and we still have WIPOW. And then the 600, uh, this is kind of the entry level. It goes more with a traditional. Uh, so if I plug a like a large uh, solid state drive into the DAC input of the AVR, I'll be able to pull up the music files through music. That's not, no, not necessarily. Uh, you can, but you have no management of it. Oh, so okay. what, what you would do is in... Yeah, from your laptop, it, you know, there's there's no tree, there's no on-screen display to be searching it, and it's it's not a a player, uh, it's just a you know storage. Um, so you need to use like a lot. You need to use like a laptop with J River or something on J it. J River Rune, yeah, I like Rune, Rune a lot. Yeah, Rune. Yeah. The only thing I don't like about Rune is it's like where all this music come from, and then you got it all over the place, and it's uh. Yeah, it's pretty cool because it just puts it all, boom. What do you want to hear? Bob James? Good. Here you go. Hit go. And I'm not even sure where it's playing it from sometimes, but it always sounds good. So mm -hmm. um, so there's that. that. Uh, and then we just kind of trickle down and then we go to the 600. Now, Gene, this is uh, the 600 doesn't have the uh, USB DAC function uh, on the back you know, with the USB B, uh, it has, uh, so this, you can take a small drive and put into this and you can search kind of with the remote control, um, right. with the on-screen display, but you don't want to be searching for very much stuff. We use them at shows and for demos, you know, cause I got 10 songs that, you know, I might want to play or something like that, but you, you won't take a little higher drive with your whole collection of I got of high of high res music. You had a slide with all the spec breakdowns of each model. Maybe you could throw yep. that on. That's coming up next. Yeah. Oop. There, we just had it. There we go. So even though we we focused on the, the 1,800 and 600, I did put the uh the 2000, some of the specs up there for that. Uh floating in balance. Of course, you got the big analog meters, uh HDMI arc. And then um, a toroid transformer, this 
uh, double bottoms on both of these, you know, on the 1,000, if you look, the 1,000 and 2,000 share a whole lot of stuff. Um, yeah. So it's, it's like a junior. It just, it doesn't have the toroid. Um, and it has top art construction instead of the, the hi-fi grade, you know, the triple bracketed and all that kind of stuff. But man, that 1,000 is really, it's, yeah, that's it's not a hell of a deal for getting close to the 2000 level of. Yeah, performing. it's not a distant second. It's it's second place, but it's not a distant, distant second unless yeah. you're really critically listening. And then we have to you know start pulling stuff off to get to hit more price points uh, just to get to the. Higher. But we keep, uh, you know, that top art uh, design, the construction design, uh, keep it rigid. Uh, keep the music cast, you know, all the stuff on the right over here it has a phono preamp, music cast, pure direct, sub out, you know, all the stuff we just messed with uh, in the music cast app is still on all three of them. Do you think the phono preamp on the 2000 is the same as the 1000? Or you think the 2000 takes it to the next level as well, like everything else? I would have to look at that. I could measure uh, it. So I'm just curious. Uh, yeah. Gonna, go yeah. go ahead and measure it because I, I, I honestly, I don't know. Uh, cause there's a couple of grades in the AS series of integrators. There's a couple of grades of, uh, phono preamp from the 3,200 down to the 1200. Sweet. And the 2000 is kind of a 1200 AS 1200. And I don't know if that trickled down into the 1000. So I, I don't know what grade of phono preamp we have in there. Well, I will definitely follow up. Um, now that I've got the units up here where my audio, audio precision is, I could start testing them. And um, of course, doing some listening. I've got some speakers at my guest room. I'll be playing this stuff on. Um, I'm looking forward because I, I was really impressed with the demos that we did when Kumasawa Sun was here. Of course, that was the 5000 series. And I think I think we did play the we did do the 2000 and yeah, yeah the 2000 speakers too yeah yeah that was great we played some phil collins and we just we had a good time it was it was good stuff don tried to steal my as 3200 <laughs> did you ever get that back <laughs> yeah he did some long-term uh quality control on it for me so. yeah long-term <laughs> quality control he liked it a lot he said he quick question sad. here is how does the new 5000 series compare to the old leg leg legendary ns 1500 500s well, you would you would know because you've probably been around. Yeah, I actually, I, I those have are the one thousands there, right? These are the one thousand Xs. So these, uh, the beryllium dome with carbon fiber. These came out in eighty uh, five, and it was just a different line. It's kind of a riff off of the uh, original NS one thousand Ms. So the original one thousands had a different purpose. They were kind of more of a monitor style speaker where the 5,000s, the current 5,000s and the 2,000, and then the smaller ones coming out are strictly audiophile music. They're musical speakers. They're made yeah. for playing music where the 1,000 series, kind of like what I have here, this version of it here, is uh, for accuracy. Doesn't care. It's just going to be accurate. <laughs> and if you're, if, yeah, it's, it's going to be accurate. But that doesn't necessarily make it musical. Uh, well, I could tell you the five thousands were very warm sounding to me. The um, the bass, the transients in the bass was excellent on those speakers. I just wasn't expecting that, and I don't know they're just they were just fun to listen to. And we weren't in the greatest acoustical environment. Obviously, it wasn't in my house. It was in uh, Don's office, but. <laughs> We didn't. We didn't break the table. That was good. We didn't break the table. It was bending. <laughs> yeah, it was bending. That stuff is heavy as hell. But yeah, well, well, Phil, I appreciate you dropping all the knowledge on these products, guys. I'll be putting some links down below. We have a preview article on the new Hi-Fi stuff, and when I do the bench test, I'll be doing follow-up videos on these. I, I'm curious to see. You know, between the 1,000, 2,000, how close the 1,000 is to the 2,000. And um, I'll be able to detect all that on the audio precision. And then, of course, we'll be doing some listening tests as well. I'm a big fan of MusicCast. I've, I've used it for many years. Um, I, I even have the original MX2000 before you even had an app. I still have that in one of my systems. Oh, wow. With, <laughs> yeah, with lots of music still on that thing. So, yeah, I've been very familiar with MusicCast over the years. 
no, it's fun. We uh, use it, and it's it's really cool to see. You don't have to sacrifice the convenience of MusicCast and the flexibility of MusicCast to do critical listening. You know, for so many years, I had you know two systems, sometimes three. I had my audio files, you know, my critical listening system. Then I had my home theater system. Oh damn! But then now I'm want to do streaming stuff. Then which system do I mix them into? It's nice to see that you can enjoy real two channel hi-fi listening without sacrificing, you know, modern technology with all the services and linking and all that kind of stuff. So it's. And, it's and last but not least, when you buy a Yamaha product, they just last forever. I mean, I've never had any reliability knock on yeah. wood. I think this is wood, my table, but <laughs> yeah, you guys have had great reliability. I've heard this from Don as well. Cause he's a, he's an integrator uh, of your products and, your stuff's built to last, and that's important when you're spending this kind of money. You want to make sure you have decades of enjoyment out of the gear. It's an investment. It's an investment. This isn't a, a throwaway. I mean, this isn't a set of earbuds that you know you don't care if they get wet in the swimming pool and then stop working. You just toss them out and get some new ones. This is something you 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 want to keep, yeah, and and build around. You know, you can add more stuff, add things to it on the outside, but uh, at the core, it's going to last you a long time and sound good. Lots of enjoyment. So I have to ask you because it was asked somewhere in here. Um, any plans on the CX replacement, CX fifty three hundred and MX? Not MX? this year. And no, I don't. I, there's nothing to announce on that. Um, everyone knows that every that people are asking for it. People are asking for it. Uh, is not on the plan yet. That's been shared. All right, guys, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. But when that news breaks, you know, I'll be the first <laughs> channel to have it. Because yeah, I want right. it. It looks cool. It looks cool. It shows. Yeah. Well, Phil, appreciate you coming on here, dropping the knowledge on your products. Guys, if you like this video, please hit the thumb up, hit subscribe. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.